Hey everyone, how's it going? Laszlo Montgomery here with an old CHP episode from way back in June of 2014. For a number of reasons. Well, one mainly. I wanted to revisit this episode and post it on my RSS feed and YouTube channels to introduce this rather unknown from Chinese American history. As many listeners of the CHP know, In addition to Chinese history, from ancient to modern times, I occasionally will feature the history of overseas Chinese, including topics on the Hokkien, Hakkas, Hoisan, and Teochews. I also featured an episode on the Chinese who emigrated to Mexico and their history and what they had to go through in that country, our neighbor to the south. I've also featured topics from Chinese American history, the Exclusion Act of 1882, the Tong Wars, uh, Ng, Doc Hay, Vincent Chin, and most recently, Dr. Jian Xiong Wu. Today, I wanted to take one more look at this old episode, and for anyone who's interested, take a look at those days of the mid to late 1800s and zero in on the life of someone who was one of the earliest crusaders of anti-racism against Asians in general and Chinese Americans in particular. The fight against racism it continues to this day. Only four months into this year of 2021, there's been a great amount of demonstrations and protests across the land calling for more acceptance of and less animosity directed against Asian Americans, including Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders. I guess you could call me, I guess I'm sort of a nobody, just an average Joe in America, yet Even in my own family, with my wife and members of her family, they too had to put up with these not particularly friendly remarks directed against them because they're Asian. So I wanted to reintroduce Wong Chin Fu and his story one more time. I hope no one objects too strongly about this. Before there was I M Pei, An Wang, Nancy Kwan, Yo Yo Ma, Anna Sui, Vivian Tam, Vera Wang, Connie Chung, Andrew Chang, Andrew Yang, Kai Fu Lee. Before there was Wayne Wang, Ishan Wang, Charles Wang, Amy Tan, Charles K. Gao, T. D. Lee, Samuel C. C. Ting, Stephen Chu, and Gary Locke, and the hundreds and hundreds of other notable Chinese Americans who contributed mightily to America's greatness in the world, there was Wong Chin Fu. And in this episode, I'd like to once again look at his life and his struggle to not only introduce Chinese customs and traditions to Americans in the late 19th century, but also for his fight to obtain normal, everyday civil rights to Chinese immigrants who, after obtaining citizenship, were proud to call themselves Chinese Americans. Two decades after Lincoln freed the slaves, Chinese in America found themselves targeted as a race of people singled out for exclusion from the American dream. Only them, no one else. So before all the great achievers of Chinese descent who made their mark in the 20th and 21st centuries, before they achieved national and international renown in art, science, business, education, politics, entertainment, medicine, in the military, and in engineering, they needed somebody to blaze the trail for them and ensure the emerging fabric of American society included them as well. The path to American citizenship for almost all Chinese immigrants after 1882 was closed completely airtight. It was impossible to find any legal way to get around the laws. 1882 1888, and 1892. These exclusion laws prohibiting Chinese immigrants any path to citizenship were enacted and enforced. Trust me, wherever there was a loophole, it didn't last long. The subject of today's CHP episode, Wang Chin Fu, wasn't the only brave Chinese American to stand up on a national level and protest these unfair laws. There was Yong Wing, Norman A. Singh, who I mentioned in CHP episode 128. There was also Ng Poon Chu and Walter Uriah Lum, to name a few more. Wong Chin Fu, together with these mostly forgotten heroes, led the charge against this terrible injustice from America's past history. Now, I don't want to make Wong Chin Fu out to be like the first Chinese American who did this or said that or portray him in that light. Like I said, 
the Chinese-American story in the 19th century was written partly by those whose names we remember, as well as the countless others, like Wang Qianfu, who, for more than a century, has slipped through the cracks of the historical record. I guess even today, Wang Qianfu would remain almost totally forgot had it not been for my good friend and author, as well as a paid-in-full member of the generation of China hands going back to the 1970s, Mr. Scott Seligman. His book called The First Chinese American, The Remarkable Life of Wang Chin Fu, was published in 2013 by the Hong Kong University Press. Wang Chin Fu's story is a pretty remarkable one for someone sort of pushed into the dustbin of old and forgotten history. Scott Seligman's work resurrected Wang Chin Fu, and through meticulous research, he's brought this man and the times he lived in back to life. To put this in perspective for my fellow Americanskis, Wang Chin Fu's period in the U.S. was spread out over the seven presidencies from Andrew Johnson to Benjamin Harrison. Now, you'd think with a name like Wang Chin Fu, he'd be one of those Chinese immigrants who made their way to the Golden Door via Taishan or one of the other counties of the Pearl River Delta region. But Wang Chin Fu, or in Mandarin, Wang Ching Fu, was not your typical Southern Chinese who made his way to the U.S. to work the mines or build the railroads. He was a Northerner from Shandong, but in the U.S., during his lifetime, he went by the name Wong, and that's how we know him today. But as our story unfolds, you'll see the last group of people he ever wanted to be lumped in with were these Chinese immigrants who came from the Pearl River Delta region. He was born Wong Sa Ke in 1847 in Ji just north of the beautiful and historic city of Qingdao. The Daoguang Emperor was in the final years of his miserable reign. In Mandarin, Wong Sa Ke's name may or may not have been Wang Sui Qi. His father was in the tea business and eh, didn't do too badly, but after being smacked down with some bad luck, father and son ended up in desperate straits, and reduced to begging to survive. And it was to Yantai, Shandong province again, that the father and son ended up. Back in those days, the city was known as Jirfu, and thanks to the treaties following the Opium War, Jirfu was one of those cities where the doors were flung open to foreign trade and missionaries. And one of those missionaries was a woman named Sally Holmes, a Southern Baptist from Upperville, Virginia a little over an hour west of the nation's capital. She and her husband, Landrum, left for China in 1858 to go do God's work, arriving in early 1859. On the last day of the year, 1860, they arrived in Jirfu, the first missionaries to do so. In July of 1861, young Wong Sa Ke was taken in and adopted by the Holmeses. By year's end, Sally lost not only her infant daughter to disease, but her husband as well, who was murdered by a gang of bandits. Remember, the 1860s were tough times in China, thanks to the general lawlessness of the day brought on by the Taiping Rebellion and the general weakness of the dying Qing Dynasty government. In July 1862, Sally moved her family to modern-day Penglai, back then called Dengzhou, midway between Yantai and Longko. The first Protestant church north of Shanghai was established there, the North Street Baptist Church. Five years later, in 1867, after a good and decent missionary school education, 20-year-old Wong Sake was baptized. To seek medical attention for her son, Sally headed back to the U.S. She brought Wong Sake with her. Sally Holmes had this thinking to train young Wong to become a missionary. The main idea was to teach him everything there was to know about the Bible and Christianity, then send him back to China to go spread the good word. Early Western missionaries learned the going was just too rough and unpredictable to try and convert the Chinese to Christianity. Language barriers, cultural barriers, you name it. It was an uphill struggle from the get-go. But it was thought... If you could get the locals up to snuff about the Bible and everything that was great about Christianity, 
you could send them into the wilds of China, and they would be able to bring the masses over to Jesus a heck of a lot easier than they ever could. In theory, that's how it worked. And there were many early Chinese Protestant missionaries who did just that. Our hero, Wang Qianfu, was not one of them. Sally Holmes' investment wasn't going to get the return she was hoping for. In fact, it turned out to be just the opposite, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Wong continued his education in the U.S., and in June 1868, there was the first ever record of his existence in the U.S. when it was noted that he attended a Methodist Episcopal Conference in Ohio. He had studied for a while at Columbian College in D.C., and then the Lewisburg Academy in Pennsylvania, today's Bucknell University. Columbian was the forerunner of today's George Washington University, both at the time Baptist schools. It was during this time, in the years immediately following the U.S. Civil War, as a student, though not for long, in the Northeast, that Wong Chin Fu began to exhibit all the characteristics that would later define him. He was only five foot four. I guess you could say he was a small guy, even by 19th century standards. Northern Chinese are usually taller and bigger than their southern brethren, but certainly this wasn't the case with Wang Chin Fu. But there was this gigantic life that belied his rather small frame. First of all, he was an incredible showman. He figured out the American system real quick, how it worked, what made Americans tick, the values, the politics, everything. The second thing is that he was educated in missionary schools as a young boy in Shandong and furthered his studies in the U.S. Northeast. So not only was he totally fluent in English, he was quite eloquent as well. And the same went with his writing. What he wasn't was an astute businessman or someone who knew when to keep his mouth shut. As the story unfolds, you'll see He didn't stand down to anyone, no matter how high and mighty they were or how much bigger they were than he was. He got the you-know-what kicked out of him repeatedly throughout his life. He wasn't a fighter who used his physical might. He used his voice, his pen, and his quick wits to dish out whatever was thrown at him in anger or condescension. You all no doubt recall from that CHP 44 episode that from about the 1870s onward... It wasn't that easy being Chinese in the U.S. It's true that most of the Chinese who came to the U.S. in the wake of the gold rush had no intention whatsoever of settling down and making a life here. Their exit plan always included a steamer back to Hong Kong or China. But many of those who came early in the 1840s and 50s planned to stay a while. I guess you could call them the first Chinese Americans. They figured they'd stay right where they were. America seemed like a land of opportunity, so far as they could tell. No Taiping rebels, no warlords, famine. This place, the USA, eh, wasn't bad. One of the terrible things about the Exclusion Acts was that not only did it seal the door shut for any aspiring Chinese immigrant laborers, it also affected those who were already here. People like Wang Chen Fu and many who came before him, like I just described. These were naturalized citizens since long before the Exclusion Act, and in a lot of cases, they were men who had cut off their cues and assimilated in all possible ways, some even marrying Caucasian wives. Those Chinese, too, all got splattered with the mud from the sections enumerated in the Exclusion Acts. Wang Chen Fu, because he was of this group, didn't stand by and just take it. He had the mind, the wits, the understanding of American people, and the eloquence in English that allowed him to fight back. So that's what he did, pretty much up until the day he died, which, by the way, even for those days, was rather young. Wang Chin Fu was not shy about getting up in front of an audience. Let's just get that out of the way. In late 1868, 21 years of age, he gave his first performance wowing an audience at an Alexandria, Virginia church who paid a quarter to hear him speak about the wonders of China and display the robes that he claimed were worn by the emperor himself. Eh, that was his shtick. Americans in the mid to late 19th century, 
They didn't know too much about China, and it's likely they had never seen an Asian person. Wong figured that out right away. And besides, of the 63,000 or so Chinese in the U.S., the overwhelming share lived west of the Continental Divide. So Wong made a modest living giving all these lectures about China, Chinese customs, religion, and the state of affairs there. And this was a staple of Wong's throughout his last decades. He knew how to put on a good show. By every indication, Wang Chinfu was very proud of his cultural roots. And of course, he came from the same province as Confucius, and he loved explaining all this to Americans. Wong toured around the nation, slowly working his way westward. By October of 1870, he pulled into San Francisco, most likely via the very transcontinental railroad that had been completed one year before. From there, his introduction to the USA came to an end, and he sailed back to China, landing there in 1871. As I mentioned, Sally Holmes and the whole Baptist church did not get their return on investment that they had hoped for. Wang Chin Fu decided early on he wasn't going to become a preacher. Now, I don't know if this was the exact reason why, but there was something about the missionaries that really rubbed him the wrong way. He didn't like how these missionaries always sent these reports home about how horrible the Chinese were, painting them in the worst possible light. There are plenty of tragic and heroic stories about what the early missionaries faced in the 1860s and 70s, but still, Wang Chin Fu didn't like how they always seemed to accentuate the negative aspects of the Chinese masses to the folks back home. Wong got himself hitched while he was back in Shandong, marrying on June 8, 1871, in a Christian ceremony in Dengzhou. Wong took on the name Wong Yanping after he got married. A lot of men did that back in those days. He still wasn't officially Wong Chin Fu yet. That came later. His son, Wong Fu Shang, would be born two years later in 1873. He moved on to Shanghai next. A Chinese who was fluent in Mandarin and English, to the degree he was, he had much better prospects there than in a sleepy town like Dengzhou. He got a job for a while with Shanghai Customs as an interpreter. He wasn't there long, and it was right about this time Wong made his break with Christianity. Shortly afterwards, in 1872, Wong was excommunicated from the Baptist Church. And then he found work upriver from Shanghai in Zhenjiang. And it was in Zhenjiang that Wong got himself mixed up with a group with some anti-Manchu sentiments. China, especially in the South, was rife with all kinds of anti-Manchu feelings. Most just wanted for them to ultimately rot to death, but some weren't so patient. And the 1870s and 80s in China were filled with all kinds of incidents of civil unrest. Wong wasn't cut out to be a rebel soldier or leader, and his career ended almost as soon as he got involved. As a result of this aborted uprising he was trying to launch in Zhenjiang, Wong Chin Fu had to flee China. He didn't make it to the ten most wanted list, but his crimes did rise to the level of Prince Gong, which is pretty high up in the Manchu leadership. Prince Gong's father was the Daoguang Emperor. His half-brother was the Xianfeng Emperor, and that counted for something. Prince Gong was a giant of 19th century Chinese diplomatic relations. Prince Gong had written to the American embassy of Wang Chinfu, quote, There was a linguist named Wang Yanping, who for some time since got up an illegal combination at Shanghai with some vagabonds, and without any certificate for what he was doing, took a lot of arms up to Zhenjiang, no doubt with the design of plunder and brigandage. Hearing that search was making for him, he managed to flee the country. End quote. After three years, Wong indeed fled China, and he wouldn't come back for a very long time partly because the Qing dynasty didn't end in his lifetime and he had a price on his head. Having already had a taste of American values and apple pie, Wong surely thought he could do well on the lecture circuit, spinning yarns about his role as a revolutionary fighter in China. This story would work well with his whole repertoire developed during his first stay in America. In no time at all, shortly after his arrival in the fall of 1873, 
the New York Times ran a piece that said of Wong's mission to China, quote, He traveled from place to place delivering addresses, full of information on subjects so entirely new to his hearers, and so much at variance with their notions of life, as to speedily cause him to become an object of concern and distrust to government officials. He launched his schemes with a rapidity that was perfectly astounding to the celestial mind, and in a brief space had laid the foundation of a score more societies, each one of which had for its purpose the improvement of the people mentally, morally, and physically. One in particular, known as the Tongshan Hui, contemplated the abolition of opium orgies, the propagation of the better social customs of America, and the elevation of the masses, end quote. I think you could get the main idea. He was an embellisher. The story of his revolutionary days over the years and the price on his head grew in size and drama with almost every telling. And all his talk about bringing the best of America to China (laughs) always played well in Pittsburgh. When his vessel arrived in San Francisco in September 1873, smuggled on board were 14 young Chinese women headed for a life working for the Hip Yi Tong and their paymasters in the skin trade. Wong learned of their plight and managed to tip off the authorities via an anonymous letter that led to some suspects being questioned and led to some of the doomed women being rescued. It was learned later that Wong was the one responsible for the whole rescue, which of course made him a marked man with some of San Francisco's Chinatown gangsters. This was another thread that ran throughout the rest of his life. The criminals who had their headquarters in Chinatown never liked Wong. He didn't like them either. He was always defending himself against those guys. Wong milked this whole incident for all it was worth and got himself into the papers, adding another chapter to his story and myth. And it's right around this time that he took on the name Wong Chin Fu. He then went and got himself an agent, and Wong hit the lecture circuit again. You see, back in those days... There wasn't any internet, no TV, no radio, no nothing like we have today. To amuse themselves, people used to do things like read books and magazines, attend the theater, and enjoy live shows and lectures. And with China being something that most people had a natural curiosity about, Wong saw a market that would allow him to make a living supplying tall tales about the land of his birth. He went all over the country, mostly east of the Mississippi, and not just to the big cities. He visited all the little nooks and crannies of the nation, wherever his agent could get him a gig, giving his lectures, wowing the local crowds. Bad luck always seemed to be just around the corner for Wong Chin Fu. Despite his success touring the nation as a China specialist, he ended up getting ripped off by one of his agents. It wasn't the first, it wasn't the last time. Wong would get screwed by his business partners, although it's said eh, he was no angel either when it came to his own fiduciary obligations. He found himself in Michigan, the Wolverine State, for a stretch, and on April 3, 1874, he filed a declaration of intention to become a U.S. citizen in the Kent County Circuit Court in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He obtained his citizenship on the very same day, and Wong Chin Fu was 27 years old and his life was already half over. But what a second half he ended up having. It was a good thing Wang Chin Fu went ahead and did this in 1874. The very next year, with the Page Act, you could start to hear the first creaking of the hinges of the immigration door beginning to shut on any immigrant laborer who might call the Yellow Emperor an ancestor. Remember, diplomats, merchants, and people in academia coming from China, though scrutinized, were still eligible. These immigration laws weren't written to exclude them. Wong got a bit of national shine on him when papers across the U.S. reprinted a story that ran in the San Francisco Chronicle called A Remarkable Chinaman. It was the story of Wong Chin Fu up to that point in late 1873. It's not certain how much of the story was fact or fiction, but it most certainly was sensational. It was so sensational that it caught the eye of Yong Wing, someone who long preceded Wong to the U.S., and though he spent many years in China for a stretch, he was like Wong, very savvy when it came to being an American. 
With Wong Chin Fu, Yong Wing knew a fraud when he saw one. Perhaps out of a sense of, you know, who the hell does this guy think he is, Yong Wing may have been the black hand behind a deluge of bad publicity that discredited Wong Chin Fu's story and made all kinds of accusations regarding his character, his swindling ways, and loose living. This bad press didn't bother Wong, and he was no slouch when it came to fighting back and defending his name. He continued to give lectures, and more and more he would attack Manchu rule in China. Prince Gong actually tried to have him extradited to China. But Wong Chin Fu had a new mission in life once 1874 rolled around. The Exclusion Act of 1882 was still eight years away, but the anti-Chinese drumbeat was getting pretty loud in the U.S. Wong was determined to turn this tide of anti-Chinese feeling by getting out there and show the positive side of China and Chinese domestic life and customs. To launch his new idea, he got the word out to the press that he was China's first Confucianist missionary to the U.S., He proclaimed he was here in America to do the same work as the Christian missionaries in China. But in his new lectures, he also began to speak about Protestant missionaries in China in a tone that was hardly complimentary. But he didn't say anything bad about Jesus or Christianity. He just tried to point out the moral and ethical similarities between Confucian thought and Christianity. He went to great lengths to disassociate himself from the Southern Chinese, who Americans were most familiar with. He explained in his lectures that he was a Northern Chinese, not one of the Southern Cantonese who he considered coolies, uneducated, and of a much lower class than he was. In Wong's mind, to put it simply, these guys made him look bad. He felt that All the negative stereotypes about Chinese in the U.S. were all due to the actions of these Cantonese workers who were only here for the money, ran all the rackets, and had no intention of assimilating or settling down in the U.S. His ploy to call himself a Chinese missionary to the U.S. had predictable results. He knew how this would play in the court of public opinion. His first speech on the subject made it to the New York Times, which printed, quote, We have long foreseen the possibility of a missionary to our country from the heathen, and one has at last arrived in the person of Wong Chin Fu. This antipodal celebrity has recently arrived in Boston, and with commendable zeal has at once begun his labors among the skeptical people of that modern Athens. During this period of his life, 1874-1875, Wong Chin Fu hadn't started attacking the Protestant religion, but he sure did take a few pot shots. In our internet age, I'm sure you've all come across these extremely vigorous debates between religious and secular people. A lot of these arguments descend into the worst, most vile, vitriolic mudslinging matches. Back in the 1800s, before radio, well, these fights were staged in the newspapers, and the religious forces of the day didn't sit back and allow someone that likes a Wong Chin Fu to besmirch their institution. Attacking Christianity was not the main theme in any of his lectures, however. He traveled across the eastern United States and into Canada, giving these Intro to China 101 lectures that Wong turned into performances. People would pay something like 25 cents for these things, maybe more if it were someone famous. In boasting about China in his lectures, he said stuff like, quote, We claim that the Chinese empire is a refined one, with all the opportunities of intellectual improvement, and that the Chinamen are not ignorant heathens, and were not so thousands and thousands of years ago. They invented some of the most useful sciences of civilization. For example, the art of printing with movable types. Also, engraving was first invented by the Chinese. They were the first to invent the mariner's compass, the first cannon, first suspension bridge, and the first marble structure, the first civil force, and the first school. All these originated among the heathens. End quote. He continued to spread the word wherever he went about the merits of the Chinese, Chinese culture, and more and more, Buddhism and Confucianism. He also let fly a continuous barrage of remarks critical of the manner in which the missionaries proselytized in China. Whatever he said that was sensationalist or controversial in any way was always picked up by the press, and many of Wong's comments 
made their way to China. The missionaries there, including his one-time benefactress, Sally Holmes, got wind of what he was going around and saying in his lectures, and naturally, they didn't like that. Some battle lines began to be drawn. Huang Chin Fu was a thin-skinned guy. That is, he didn't like being criticized, attacked, or disparaged. The slightest insults or perceived insults always triggered some kind of response, and sometimes fights ensued. (sighs) Good thing he didn't start his own podcast. Throughout the 1870s, Wong made it his business to rebut every assertion made by religionists that painted Chinese in an inferior light. As the 1880s started to come into view, the matter of Chinese immigrants had become a favorite populist issue among the national politicians. Wong made it his mission to defend the Chinese in his own way. He told a New York Sun reporter in 1876, quote, America need not be afraid that its labor will be crippled by the Chinese. No, sir. Each succeeding year, the Chinamen in America will claim and receive more wages. Our people get rich in a few years and then go back to China again. They never make this their home. They do not vote and they rarely become naturalized. There are about 50,000 of us in all in this country. The number will never amount to much more. In 10 years, those that are here will be so far Americanized, they will work for nothing less than what is paid to Americans. End quote. When the call for halting Chinese immigration became louder than ever before, Wong became one of the many voices that spoke out against all the talk of legislation to check this tide. But after a while, his ongoing prejudice against the southern Chinese laborers got in his way. Soon he began to alter his position. Remember, he looked down on these Cantonese workers and saw them as part of the problem and the reason for so much American outrage against Chinese immigrants. He insisted they were a different kind of Chinese than he was. That would be a tough argument to make in today's world, let alone a hundred and more years ago. It was a long frustration of Wong that Americans didn't understand the difference between Northern and Southern Chinese. Before long... Wong adjusted his position and sort of agreed that if the laws targeted these kinds of Chinese only, limits on immigration eh, weren't so bad after all. His main point was that the assimilated and taxpaying Chinese who were already here, who were already naturalized, speaking fluent English and living amongst other Americans freely, these were the good Chinese. And in no way should this group, of which he considered himself a part, suffer any of the indignities that were being heaped on the masses of southern Chinese immigrants. Wong based himself in Chicago for a while. Trouble followed him wherever he went. Chinatown elements there, like elsewhere, didn't like him at all, and at times tried to have him dealt with. Wong Chin Fu continued to wear a queue up until 1879. This was a few years before the Exclusion Act became law on May 8th, 1882. So you can imagine the kind of public discourse going on between San Francisco and New York. None of it was good, and Wong threw himself in the middle of it, speaking out and coming up with publicity stunts that called attention to the hypocrisy and illegality of Chinese exclusion. Wong Chin Fu, with some financial backers, got into the newspaper business. He wasn't the first person in America to publish a Chinese-language newspaper, but he was the first one on the East Coast to do so. On February 3rd, 1883, the weekly Hua Mei Xin Bao came out. Though Hua Mei Xin Bao doesn't translate to this, he called the paper the Chinese-American, the first time anyone ever used this term. Regarding the tone of the paper... The Washington Post wrote that Wong's Chinese-American, quote, continues to attack the celestial embassy at Washington with extreme acerbity, end quote. The representatives of the Manchu-Ching government in the U.S., they knew all about Wong Chin-Fu and his anti-Ching sentiment, and they took their measures to quash this paper. But the good old First Amendment foiled their plans. In addition to running the first of several short-lived money-losing papers Wong would launch in his lifetime, he earned an income writing articles for other newspapers and magazines. The Chinese American lasted about seven months before it was shut down. This was a small victory for not only the Qing government, but also for Chinatown criminal elements whose 
criminal businesses Wong railed against in his paper. By now, although not what you'd call a big-time celebrity, Wong Chin Fu had acquired a national reputation. After the Exclusion Act ended Chinese immigration for these laborers, many of these Cantonese workers who came for the money sooner or later returned to China, never to return to America, or at least not until the laws changed. This meant that the population of Chinese in the U.S., with few new immigrants to shore up their numbers, began to decline. Not only did their numbers decline, many Chinese Americans began to move eastward, abandoning California with so many vicious racists shaking their fists at them. This is how the Chinese communities in Chicago and New York began to fill up a lot. The racism was a little nicer in New York than on the West Coast, but it was still alive and well, and the stories that got out in the press were hardly complimentary of China or the Chinese. The usual targets were alleged Chinese hygiene and the whole laundry list of despicable crimes that Chinatown was still famous for, running fan-tan parlors and other games of chance, prostitution, female slavery, and opium. People in those days, the 1880s, just came out on record saying the most vile and unflattering things about the Chinese, and the newspapers gladly printed everything. And wherever and whenever the anti-Chinese American accusations flew, Wong would be there to stand up against whoever it was, and he'd throw whatever dirt right back at his accusers, using his quick mind, education, and fluency in English to turn the tables. He would often confound his detractors, beating them at their own game, using the press, publicity stunts, and whatever else he could think of to defend the Chinese against all these insinuations and accusations. For this, Wong Chin Fu got roughed up a lot, and he knew the drill inside out about how to deal with getting arrested, and he spent many nights in jail, and having studied some law before, he knew his way around the American court system, too. One of Wang Chin Fu's signature battles concerned the famous demagogue, bigot, and scourge of the Chinese Americans, Mr. Dennis Kearney. Kearney had taken it upon himself to lead the efforts to get rid of all Chinese from these shores. He had a lot of support from organized labor and the lower classes. He was one of those guys who was quite gifted as a speaker, but his diatribes against the Chinese and also against the capitalist class were a little too much for many. He was hot for a few years, but his circus train ran out of steam after a while. He was an Irish immigrant from County Cork. The Irish and the Chinese sort of had a kind of rivalry that got a little violent every now and then. They both competed for the same muscle jobs, working in the mines and on the railroads, and I don't have to tell you who was always willing to work for less. And on top of that, their respective neighborhoods and the cities they might both populate tended to rub up against one another on a map. And you know what happens when that happens. So there was no love lost between these two ethnic groups back in the 19th century. Wong Chin Fu had, of course, read about Dennis Kearney and knew who he was and what he stood for. So when Kearney, an immigrant himself, took his populist show on the road in 1883 all the way to the Big Apple, Wong sought him out. In response to Kearney's rants about how horrible the Chinese were, Wong fired an opening salvo in this way, quote, I belong to the most ancient empire on this globe. You, by your statement, belong to the most dependent and ill-treated nation of serfs ever deprived their liberties. The flag of my country floats over the third greatest navy in the world. Yours is to be seen derisively displayed on the 17th of March in public streets and triumphantly hoisted on an occasional gin mill. The ambassadors and consuls of my nation rank at every court in Europe with those of Russia, Germany, England, and France. Those of your race may be found cooling their heels in the lobbies of any common council in which rum-selling interests and politics predominates. The race which I represent is centuries old in every art and science, 
that of which you are a spokesman, apologizes for its present ignorance and mental obscurity with the plea that your learning and literature are lost in the mythical past. End quote. Charlie Chan was still 44 years in the future, but this is how Chinese tended to sound when they would attempt to fight back in public, and the press would have a field day mocking their Chinglish. Few Chinese had Wang Chin Fu's combination of eloquence, education, and guts to stand up to people that were bigger and more powerful than he was. He accused Kearney of, quote, stirring up the prejudices of your ignorant but well-meaning brother Irishman, end quote. And when Kearney dodged Wong and refused to face off in a public debate, Wong ratcheted up the heat a little. He started making all these public statements about how Kearney was too scared to debate him, and the whole thing, of course, became a national spectacle. In the end, Wong Chin Fu had stood up to Kearney and his racist politics. Whether anyone was willing to admit it or not, Wong bested his opponent in the press. It would be another four years before they faced off in person. This was another wake-up call for Wong Chin Fu and perhaps for many other Chinese Americans. One thing the Irish knew was how to organize politically. The Chinese hadn't figured that one out yet. Of course, their numbers were far fewer. But Wong knew the reason the politicians screwed them was because they didn't vote. Because they didn't have any political power, they had nothing to bargain with on these political issues of the day. On July 29, 1884, Wong in his capacity as a Chinatown central figure, called a meeting of all Chinese voters in the New York area. At this meeting, Wong told his fellow Chinese, quote, We are a small drop in the mighty ocean of American politics, but as small and insignificant as we are, I feel certain that had we only attended to this duty as citizens of this country, we might have prevented the passage of the shameful anti-Chinese bill by Republican Congress, end quote. Wong tried to organize as best he could and to create some sort of political organization. And into 1883, 1884, 1885, violence against Chinese raged up and down the West Coast. And you'll recall from CHP 44, the Rock Springs Massacre, where a dispute over Chinese depressing workers' wages led to the violent death of 28 Chinese with 15 injured. Chinese homes and businesses were fair game for the racist mobs in the great state of Wyoming. Wang Chin Fu was, in 1884, 37 years old. Any business venture he was associated with either went bust or ended in acrimony, or both. Now he started toying with the idea of opening up a Chinese theater that would bring a little Chinese-style entertainment to New York. The press, as usual, whenever Wong was involved, had a field day with the usual degree of snark, puns, and jabs at whatever it was that Wong Chin Fu was promoting. Wong earned his daily manto, remember he was a northerner, mostly as a writer, selling his stories to various New York newspapers and magazines. Lectures and newspapers were his meat and potatoes, but these newspaper editors always had to put their best fact-checkers on these pieces Wong submitted. He had a reputation for stretching the truth to make his points. Readers just ate up all his articles describing everything there was that he could recall or make up about his ancestral homeland and the culture that he took so much pride in. I didn't mention this in that CHP 128 episode on the history of American Chinese cuisine, but Wong Chin Fu was one of those writers in the 1880s who wrote about Chinese cuisine, and chop suey in particular, which he, early on, called, quote, the national dish of China. He contributed a voice to the discussion about this exotic chow chop suey that could be had by the adventurous who were willing to risk an evening in Chinatown. If he wasn't the first to write about chop suey, well, he certainly was one of the first. In March of 1886, the North American Review ran a series of articles where they invited people to write about religion. The title of each article was supposed to start, quote, Why am I a... and then you filled in your religion. Wong was one of those invited to submit a piece, and this one really got a lot of attention. Up until now, his beef was with the Protestant missionaries who he believed gave China a bad name through all their dispatches from the front lines. But Christianity, that was something else. 
Wong didn't attack Jesus or Christians, but with his contributions to the review called Why Am I a Heathen? He threw down the gauntlet in a rather spectacular way. So when he came out of the ring swinging like he did, satirizing the religion, the money aspect, and all the various forms of Christianity, the forces who all disagreed with him pounced. This tempest was not only felt across the U.S., but within the missionary society in Shanghai as well. Everyone came forward to deconstruct Wong's arguments. You name it. From Life magazine on down. Everyone sounded off on this one. Dennis Kearney came back to the U.S. East Coast in October 1887. And that month, Kearney and Wong finally met in person at the offices of the New York World and verbally slugged it out in front of an assembled crowd. Plenty of mud was slung at each other, but at least, according to the Rockford, Illinois Gazette, quote, the Mandarin got the better of the San Francisco orator in the intellectual contest and drove Kearney from position to position until the Sandlot hoodlum gave up in disgust, end quote. The New York Sun wrote that Wong did not, quote, stand on the defensive against Mr. Dennis Kearney, but assumed the offensive in a fashion which no Chinaman in this country has yet equaled, end quote. Despite the why am I a heathen brouhaha, Wong bounced back after his trouncing of Dennis Kearney. He continued on the lecture circuit after that. Canada followed the United States in enacting anti-Chinese immigration laws. Naturally, Wong went up there to go speak out against this. He sparred with the Canadian government in 1888, mostly about a $50 head tax that was levied against any Chinese coming to Canada. Like him or hate him, Wong remained a fixture in the New York Chinatown community. He continued to write for many publications, speaking his mind and as always, trying to influence American attitudes towards Chinese. Sometimes he gave his American readers food for thought. Sometimes he missed the mark. He had both loyal supporters and enemies who wished him death or worse. In 1892, ten years after the passing of the Chinese Exclusion Act, there came the Gary Act. This extended the exclusion of Chinese laborers and added some more degrading conditions. Most odious of all was the regulation about Chinese having to henceforth carry identity cards. Wong, along with a few other Chinatown heavyweights, formed the Chinese Equal Rights League. Even the six companies in San Francisco, the Chinese Benevolent Association, they too got involved in the chorus, calling on Chinese not to register for these ID cards. A meeting was held in New York, September 22, 1892, attended by 200 of the leading Chinese in the community. Quote, Chinese who dress in American trousers and derby hats, the Chicago Tribune pointed out. In the end, after impassioned speeches regarding the Gary Act, those assembled adopted the following resolution. Quote, We, the citizens of the United States and mass meeting assembled, do hereby resolve and declare that said bill is monstrous, inhuman, and unconstitutional and we hereby pledge ourselves to support and protest against said bill, which has been entered by the Chinese Equal Rights League of New York City, end quote. The Chinese Equal Rights League gave it their best shot throughout 1892. By the end of the year, though, the New York Times had written, quote, The Chinese Equal Rights League has not chosen a favorable time for agitating for the repeal of the Chinese Exclusion Act. It is asking too much to demand the Chinese residents here be forthwith admitted to citizenship and given the franchise of the nation. End quote. The piece concluded by saying the Chinese Equal Rights League quote, should be more moderate in its representations and more modest in its demands. End quote. The Gary Act passed in 1892. Wang Chin Fu fought it with everything he had. Later on November 2nd, 1893, he even appeared before a congressional committee and faced down Thomas Gary himself to get part of the act struck down. But in the end, all efforts failed. Over the next few years, Wong Chin Fu was based in Chicago and busied himself with various money-losing ventures that he was passionate about. There was another newspaper, a Confucian temple, his political activities, and of course, agitating for the end of Manchu rule in China. Late in 1896, he received a letter from his son in China. 
Since Wong left China in 1873, he had neither seen his son or his wife, who was now ill. In June of 1898, Wong headed to China, arriving in Hong Kong on June 20th. It had been two and a half decades since Wong Chin Fu had left Asia. Upon arrival in Hong Kong, Wong had to deal with the matter of a passport. He applied at the consulate and was granted a passport. After all, he had the letters of introduction and all the necessary evidence that showed he was a naturalized American citizen. So why shouldn't the American consul there issue a passport? After securing his passport in Hong Kong, Wong went after some old business partners trying to collect on debts that were due to him. As was pretty much always the case, he got screwed. He managed to recover some money, but nothing near what he expected. But that wasn't the end of it. The consulate had checked with the State Department regarding the issuing of the passport to Wong. After all, he was still Chinese, and the consul in Hong Kong wasn't sure about how things worked exactly with, you know, the new laws. After clarification, the consulates tracked down Wong, seized his passport, and promptly canceled it. As Scott Seligman put it succinctly, quote, it was the final indignity visited upon Wong Chin Fu by his adopted country, of which he was, in fact, a bona fide citizen. End quote. Wong left Hong Kong in the ghastly July summer heat, arriving in Dengzhou in Shandong sometime later that month. He had a tearful and emotional reunion with his wife and son, who he had not seen since he was born. It didn't take long for Wong Chin Fu to hear word that the Manchus had sent the authorities to come look for him. From Dengzhou, Wong went east to Weihai, an hour car ride west of one of his childhood homes of Jirfu. The British were now in command of the port city of Weihai, and Wong figured he'd be safer there. And it was there in Weihai, on September 13, 1898, Wong Chin Fu died. He died from heart failure, and no doubt a broken heart, brought on by his long fight, all the disappointments and political setbacks piled one on top of the other, his business failures always getting swindled, but perhaps most of all, his failure to change the anti-Chinese laws, and no doubt also the rigors of travel back in those days. So what was Wang Chin Fu's legacy? The exclusion laws continued on for decades after his death. Forty-five more years. He couldn't change those in his lifetime. He was the first person to call himself a Chinese-American and spoke out for what this meant to him. Someone who learned English, who dressed in the American way, cut their cues off and didn't live out in public, all those negative stereotypes American people had of the cheating, gambling, opium-smoking Chinamen. He established the first Chinese political party in the country, and he was the first to testify before the U.S. Congress. Let me quote again from Scott Seligman. Quote, Wong's importance lies not merely in envisioning and articulating the goal, but in the means he employed and the energy he expended in trying to achieve it. No one else traversed the country as tirelessly to speak out for America's Chinese or wrote as extensively or as passionately to portray them as benign and acceptable. Wong offered Americans a broad window on China and was, for many, the face of the Chinese in America. Wong surely changed some American minds and won some hearts through his very demeanor, if not his Herculean efforts and his boundless optimism. He not only had to convince Americans that Chinese were law-abiding citizens whom they need not fear, he also had to persuade his own countrymen that there was a value in assimilation, even as the messages coming from white America were so hate-filled and discouraging. End quote. So, Wong Chin Fu, everyone. Not a household name, but certainly a life worth knowing about. I strongly recommend the book, The First Chinese American, The Remarkable Life of Wong Chin Fu. The author is Scott Seligman. Some of you may be familiar with some of his earlier works, The Cultural Revolution Cookbook, Three Tough Chinamen, Chinese Business Etiquette, Chinese at a Glance, and Now You're Talking Chinese. His two most recent works are The Third Degree, The Triple Murder That Shook Washington and Changed American Criminal Justice, and most recently, The Great Kosher Meat Wars of 1902. I'll have a link to all those books at my website at teacup.com. 
media. Go check it out. Now, I'm not going to give you the hard sell or anything, but anyone out there wishing to support the CHP and all my efforts at getting this material out there, go head over to patreon.com slash China History Podcast and sign up. Three bucks, 36 bucks a year. You cannot fathom how thankful I will be. Patreon, not your thing. Go over to paypal.me slash China History Podcast. Throw me a few pesos, florins, dinars, or rupees, and you can rest assured you'll have my eternal thanks. Okay, that's it for now. Laszlo Montgomery here signing off from Los Angeles, California, wishing you all my very best and beseeching you, as I always do, to come back next time for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.